Good morning and welcome to another of the webinar series that we've provided from the University of Houston Energy Organization, specifically the Center for Carbon Management and Energy and our webinar series. We've got a great uh, group today and, and a topic as well as some great speakers. And of course, it's titled The Permian, a Geologic Value Creation and CO2 Utilization. My name is Chuck McConnell. I'm the uh, director for the Center of Energy and, uh, and, and CO2 Management uh, at, the, at the university. I, I think we would like to also offer our thoughts and prayers for all of those in the Golden Triangle and Louisiana that uh, suffered the hurricane. We weren't even sure we were gonna have this today, but uh, we're, we're certainly fortunate here in Houston that, uh, that we are able to have this webinar and, and continue on, but we did wanna offer our thoughts to, to those that are, that are in that area. Want to also thank you for this webinar series to our ongoing and regular sponsor, uh, Hunton Andrews and Kurth, who have been a big part of the content for many of the other webinars that we've had earlier uh, this this year and and through our season, have been a steadfast supporter of the Center for Carbon Management and Energy at the university, and we uh, again thank them. Uh, very much for their continued support of this activity. We'd encourage you to go to our webinar series recap on our website uh, at the University of Houston CCME. You see the uh, trailer there in front of you. It has a number of our webinars over the past several months archived for your viewing pleasure. There's a lot of information, both technical, commercial, policy, legal, uh, much of all of the challenges that we face in the, the energy industry as we go through energy transition and, and move in that direction. So please take a look at our website and also to recognize some of the upcoming events as well as those archived webinars. While our presentation is going on today, uh, please note that the chat function on your uh, your the chat function on the, um, well, okay, we're going through the slides a little differently. There we go. Uh, it's available for you to ask questions. Uh, sorry for that little blip. But as the presentation is, is going on, uh, please submit your questions, not only during the presentation, but also as we get into the Q&A, sometimes the Q&A allows for a question to beg for another question. So please feel free to do that. Um, I think the, the, the best part now is the, our speakers and providing a lot of, of insight into what we're gonna be talking about today. First, our, uh, uh, one of our lead professors in petroleum engineering at the University of Houston uh, needs no introduction from me in terms of background, but Christine Economides, uh, will be speaking in, in some depth uh, at the beginning of this presentation regarding the point sources of CO2 in and around the Houston area, the, the Houston Ship Channel, the greater Gulf Coast area, and speaking to some of the challenges that we all recognize in terms of CO2 management, in terms of capturing that CO2 and, and doing it in a cost-effective manner. But then, of course, we all recognize that even though we have a number of close-in areas uh, to consider in terms of geology for disposition of that CO2, including some of the offshore uh, concerns and, and potentials that we have looked at, and, and also some of the existing pipeline systems that are out there. But we have um, with us today, Steve Melzer, who is a um, renowned, knowledgeable person regarding the Permian Basin, uh, with activity in the EOR, with the ROS, uh, as, a, as the owner of Melzer Consulting, uh, Steve has been uh, for many years involved in that area. Uh, and everyone in the Midland Odessa area, I think knows Steve, and I'm sure many of you as well, very familiar with, uh, with Steve and his organization. 
Steve's going to talk about the, the Permian from the perspective of not just EOR and a repository for oil production, but in fact, now as we look at the Permian Basin and we look at the geology in that Permian Basin, we have a, a real unique opportunity globally, really, not just for our state of Texas, looking at that geology as an accretive asset to the industry, not just for EOR and oil production, but for the disposition of CO2. And of course, the size, scope, and all of the, the functional requirements for disposition, there's probably no other known repository of geology quite like the Permian. So I see we're getting ready to, uh, to put up the initial presentation material. I just encourage you to, again, use the chat function. We'll be able to have the uh, Q&A at the end of this presentation and, and be able to take that up. So Kyle, I'm going to turn the screen back over to you, if I could, and uh, we can begin to uh, share the presentation for both Christine and Steve. I'll just start with a big thank you to Chuck McConnell for the very nice introduction. Uh, that's on behalf of Steve and myself. We're going to talk about Texas carbon capture, utilization, and storage project development. Uh, we'll talk about what's already happened and uh, what you can look forward to. You can start with this lovely geologic map of the state of Texas with the spotlight shown on the Permian Basin area. And that's where all the action is, as we will see today. So I'll kick this off with an overview and a bit on the history of San Andres Formation uh, examples. And uh, then we'll pass the baton over to Steve Melzer and he'll talk about residual oil zones. And he's got such a lot of passion about this subject. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it. Uh, and then uh, at the very end, uh, he'll mention why we need lots more people and new expertise uh, to make this really happen. So let's start with the legal framework, uh, and in particular, we'll focus first on process CO2. Uh, so that's a product, uh, and it's a specified product. So different uh, buyers of process CO2 have different specifications. It could be things like 95% purity and uh, a pressure above 1500 PSI. So as such, that's a historically valued commodity uh, on the surface and in the ground. And uh, one of the ways it's valued is for enhanced oil recovery, or EOR, uh, and in particular for CO2 enhanced oil recovery. There's actually 50 years, five decades of experience uh, with CO2 EOR. It involves the processing plans, the pipelines, and the reservoir management. And this has all been subject to mineral law, at least in the United States. Today, there's a lot of interest in carbon capture utilization and storage, uh, a term that uh, Chuck McConnell is known to have coined. And uh, it's basically the same thing as CO2 EOR, except the CC is about carbon capture. Um, and so we're going to talk about using process CO2 instead of what has been used in the past, which is CO2 coming from uh, natural formations underground. Uh, so we'll be able to leverage all this reservoir experience uh, and just simply change uh, what is our CO2 source. 
So a bit more on the legal framework. Uh, let's distinguish between CCUS, which we just explained what that is, and CCGS. Uh, so first, let's uh, mention that in April 2009, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, declared CO2 suddenly as a pollutant. Uh, so CO2 has, for more than 100 years, been vented, um, you know, since the uh, Industrial Revolution, vented from industrial processes and certainly also in transportation um, so it's formerly just been considered, you know, a natural compound. Um, you know, the, the trees and the plants can't live without CO2. Uh, but now it's more and more considered as a contaminant. And the reason for this has to do with climate change. Uh, and climate change initiatives are setting objections, objectives uh, to reduce atmospheric CO2 concentration. So CO2 can be used for enhanced soil recovery, hence CCUS. And uh, when we do that, uh, the CO2 we use it in uh, CCUS is classed as process CO2. Interestingly though, if instead we simply inject the CO2 into um, geologic formations, often these are saline aquifers, uh, salty aquifers, um, for permanent storage, then this is uh, classed as carbon capture and geologic storage, CCGS, and then we class the CO2 as waste. Even though it may have come from a process, it's now classed as waste. It's all in where you put it. Well, um, a little more on regulatory oversight. Uh, this to do with the injection wells. Uh, so we have um, underground injection control specifications um, defining what are class two wells and class six wells. Uh, so class two wells are governed by state regulations. Uh, and again, uh, these are relying on 50 years of experience and, and very large volumes uh, that have been used for pressure maintenance and enhanced soil recovery. Uh, the Class 6 designation is introduced by the EPA, uh, so these are federal regulations. Uh, but some states uh, have sought or are seeking uh, primacy, uh, so North Dakota, for example. Uh, I think has uh, achieved primacy, which means uh, the EPA allows them to regulate these wells. Uh, experience is only over the last uh, more or less 10 years, last decade. Um, and one of the things that we have learned uh, is uh, that small injection volumes into saline aquifers can raise the reservoir pressure. Uh, and the reservoir engineers should not be too surprised by that. Uh, because when you are injecting into a saline aquifer, the pore space is already full of water, which is um, no more compressible than the rock itself. Uh, so it, it is a challenge uh, to put CO2 into aquifers. Um, these regulations pay a lot more attention to reporting of the injection volumes than uh, the earlier experience uh, regarding um, CCUS uh, has done. So it's, it's a big experience, uh, PB, Permian Basin. Um, since 1982, uh, there, have, there has been more than a gigaton of uh, CO2 uh, injected for uh, EOR, for Enhanced Oil Recovery. Uh, this has produced 1.6 billion barrels of crude oil. And uh, the, this is the equivalent of uh, 3 gigawatts uh, to, the, to the CO2 we could capture from 3 gigawatts of uh, coal-fired um, electricity generation. Um, 
So it's, it's, it's a big number. Um, looking at the history of the Permian Basin, uh, we can contrast two things. Uh, on the left, we're looking at uh, just crude oil production, all of it, uh, all from the Permian Basin. Uh, and so the first part that we see here um, is uh, mainly conventional oil. And uh, we can see that conventional oil production rose up to about 2 million barrels per day peak. Uh, in 1974, and then declined uh, until suddenly this steep rise in production. And this is when um, the operators began successfully applying um, tight oil production in uh, the new uh, wells. It's a new technology involving horizontal wells and uh, hy hydraulic fracturing. So some of these wells are um, 20,000 feet, four miles long, all underground, and then uh, with hydraulic fractures all along them. Um, there are dozens of uh, hydraulic fractures, even more than a hundred sometimes. Um, so eventually uh, this has risen to nearly five million stock tank barrels per day, and it's been game-changing for the United States. Uh, and there has been uh, similar success also uh, with tight oil in the pocket in North Dakota. Um, regarding, though, uh, CO2 EOR, uh, we see that the Permian Basin um, accounts for most of the U.S. production by this mechanism, basically most of the world production as well because the U.S. Uh, certainly leads in uh, CO2 EOR. Um, the scales are the same uh, on these, and so we see that uh, this is not even half a million uh, stock tank barrels per day. So the, the rates, if, if we consider them on this plot, are below the first grid line. Uh, so overall, this is a pretty small fraction of um, U.S. oil production but it's still uh, significant. Uh, so here, looking uh, on the left, uh, we can see a zoom to show you where our uh, active uh, production uh, wells in uh, the San Andres, uh, which is the main formation um, that has used this uh, CO2 EOR so successfully, it's carbonate formation. Uh, and uh, the means San Andres unit uh, production is graphed over here. Um, and I'm uh, thanking uh, Ganesh Thakur for this graph. And if you saw his uh, webinar, the last one in this series, uh, you saw him talk about this. Uh, and this is just to uh, remind that um, these um, CO2 EOR processes are capable of maintaining essentially a constant rate over, uh, in this case, it's more than 20 years. Um, so with um, infill wells, artificial lift, and uh, CO2 water in uh, alternating gas uh, reservoir management um, is a huge success. Uh, there are currently 80 uh, active CO2 EOR projects uh, in um, San Andres. So here's the thing. Um, people are interested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, if we look at the extremes, you've got people advocating things like Green New Deal. Uh, and Green New Deal says to stop all fossil fuel combustion. Uh, then you've got some people that um, don't even think uh, global warming is real, uh, just a hoax. So these are two extremes, but most people are somewhere in the middle and uh, most petroleum companies are somewhere in the middle. Uh, and the middle says sources of energy are huge. They are vital. Our standard of living depends on this. Uh, currently more than 80% of the energy we consume is uh, sourced from fossil. Uh, so from coal, natural gas, and crude oil, and um, we can apply technology 
to find ways to reduce these greenhouse gas emissions without going to these extremes. So uh, here we look at a very interesting map uh, that is showing us CO2 sources and sinks uh, and uh, pipelines. So the blue wiggles are uh, CO2 pipelines. Um, and over here you can see a list that explains what the colors of the dots mean. Uh, so these are all uh, point source um, ways to get CO2. Um, uh, so let's focus on just a few things. Um, first of all, um, the five decades of experience relates to formations that you see circled here. So the Bravo Dome, McElmo Dome, uh, and Sheep Mountain uh, in our principal CO2 uh, formation sources. Uh, and once pipelines were constructed, uh, linking these uh, CO2 formations to the Permian Basin, San Andres, um, CO2 EOR uh, became a reality, uh, and that's back in 1982. Uh, so the sink for the CO2 is um, the San Andres Formation uh, CO2 injection for the purpose of producing uh, uh, crude oil. But looking to the future, um, the interest is in these process CO2 sources. Uh, so they're, they're not yet uh, most of them available, uh, but these are locations of point sources where we could consider uh, capture from uh, these stationary uh, sources of CO2. Um, so if we capture and gather uh, from these point sources, what we miss is the blue line. We still don't have a pipeline. And so uh, the missing link, if you will, is to connect up uh, what we could gather from uh, capture from the uh, Gulf Coast industrial point sources and uh, pipeline those to the Permian Basin. So last slide, um, just a, an idea of uh, the volumes uh, that could be available from these point sources. Uh, so thinking of this in, in terms of the um, National Petroleum Council phases, uh, so the activation phase one involves mostly uh, act activity that Denbury uh, has already been active in um, for several years. Um, so they are already capturing um, CO2 mainly from hydrogen production uh, and pipelining it to uh, uh, oil reservoirs in uh, Mississippi, Alabama uh, area and uh, in South Texas. Uh, so uh, this is ongoing and uh, uh, expected to be um, expanded in this activation phase. Uh, then we get to a second phase, um, which uh, you can see ramps up to a great many more uh, point sources. Um, cost of capture is higher here, uh, so I think today we don't really have uh, sufficient incentives. 45Q would not get you to these. Uh, and also uh, over a certain time frame, uh, we would hope to see that pipeline I mentioned uh, get constructed. Uh, and there's even a third phase uh, that could uh, include the remaining point sources, uh, and this you would do if your objective is uh, to get to net zero emissions uh, along the Gulf Coast. Well, this second phase will actually net you, uh, could net you more uh, CO2 than the historical supply that's been coming from the um, geologic formations. Uh, so it, it could make sense. Well, I'll pass this on to uh, Steve Melser, and he's going to take you on a ROZ journey. So thanks for your attention, and uh, let's see what Steve has to say. Well, good morning. 
I'd like to take you on a journey. Uh, we're going to journey down the residual oil zone pathway. Uh, so let's take a field trip. There's a little bit of a side note here. Um, got uh, one of the trips uh, out to the field in West Texas, the Permian Basin, and then we're in the area of the St. Andrews Formation that you heard a little bit about this morning. It all started here. It uh, became obvious to some of us that there were some unusual oil shows below the oil water contact in many of these fields, St. Andrews fields in West Texas, and sometimes they were as thick as four or 500 feet. And it, uh, the model that we've all learned in our schooling has been something like this, where you have a transition zone where the surface tension and capillarity forces control the, the uh, attenuation, if you will, of the oil saturations with depth below the oil water contact. And I'll use the oil water contact definition is kind of the producing oil water contact that we've uh, all used in our fields where we decided if 90% of the fluids were oil, that's the oil producing oil water contact. But we knew there was a transition below that. And so uh, we generally just lumped it into a transition zone thinking. And so this one presents a bit of an enigma. It's a little thick. So what do we do? Well, uh, the best fit to this looks to be something like this now with a transition on top and a transition on bottom separated by a pretty thick zone of nearly constant oil saturations. And that had a scratch in our head for a long time. So knowing that that's maybe the better fit and sometimes it's, you know, 300 feet thick, sometimes it's 100 feet thick, sometimes it's not present. But in the St. Andrews, underneath our St. Andrews oil fields, it generally was present. And in this particular case, those oil shows uh, were 450 feet thick. The fascinating thing is this particular example comes from an area without a main peso. In other words, there wasn't, on top of this, there wasn't a, um, a, a zone of, of mobile oil. So what we did is we said, okay, let's take a theory that maybe that this was the base of a paleo trap. In other words, sometime in the geologic past, we had a bigger trap than what we had currently at discovery time. So we ended up with a paleo trap that was much, much thicker. And this is an example at uh, Seminole Field in Gaines County where we, we had seen some uh, idealization, if you will, of the oil saturation of the field with depth being something like this. This is the conventionally productive zone above the oil water contact and dream there with oil saturations generally ranging at about 85%. In other words, 15% of the uh, fluids in the, in the uh, cores uh, that they took were, were water. And then we had the yellow zone, which we, in this case was pretty thick and and then we had what we called the paleo transition zone at the bottom where it, it fell off to zero but you know before the year 2000 we we would call this uh, oil reservoir uh, profile transition zone even though it really did stretch our imagination to do that this one particularly was three to 400 feet thick, depending on where you were in the field. And so uh, quite, uh, quite a challenge to our concept of transition zones. And, and in some other areas, they had seen the same thing. They just kind of lumped it into this upper part, transition zone slash ROZ, and, and left it at that and forgot about this zone below. What we did is we said, okay, there's some theories out there that uh, the St. Andrews was laterally water swept in its geologic past. And so we, so I started thinking about this zone here that uh, could be laterally swept. And I would say too that Hess had, had, had named this interval residual oil zone. So taking that and 
sitting at a table in, in Washington one day with the Department of Energy, I was talking about this and a theory that we had developed back in about the 2005 time frame. And I said, you know, we, we probably need to dive into this in a major way. Some of the major oil companies have really understood this, um, these zones a little better than what's in the literature. So let's, let's tackle that. So they gave me, gave me some money and, and uh, we went off and, and started writing up a story that tried to explain residual oil zones. And it really does involve geology and it d does involve engineering data that we were gathering from some of the majors, very cooperative majors at the time, Hess and Shell and, and Oxy in particular, Mobile also. So let's take a upper left view of a, a hypothetical um, trap. This would be a, a trap that has an underlying oil water con contact and an aquifer below it. And let's just ignore the fact there needs to be a transition zone if they're producing oil water contact. But let's, let's for the moment think about that. And then let's think about some tectonic event that occurs after this oil entrapment, after it's buried at depth and the oil is generated from the organic material. And the first type that we tried to describe was a tilt, a regional tilt. And some people have told me, and I've, I've actually witnessed a little bit of this in the Middle East, uh, and the uh, entire basin was tilted. And so this example on the lower left is a basin-wide tilt down to the west or down, down to the left on your graphic. And so we uh, had to readjust, nature had to readjust that old water contact. And so that zone then that was invaded, uh, formerly occupied by oil, but invaded by water, had to move up and readjust to gravity leaving us a wedge, if you will, of residual oil if, if she left any of that oil behind. Then there's the other type we call type two, which is fairly common around the world, I think, in, in, in the sense that we get an entrapment and then we have either a, a slow leak uh, through the seal of the oil and gas, maybe it's preferentially gas, and then the oil water contact has to move up. As an example here, I actually showed a little fault and, and so maybe it leaked along that fault when it was episodically activated and then it rehealed and, and you ended up with another oil column smaller than the original entrapment. Well, the difference between those two then would be a residual oil zone of type two, we call it. The third type is what we're going to spend some time on this morning, and that has to do with uh, what we call a laterally swept uh, uh, ROZ. And we've changed the hydrodynamic conditions in the aquifer below the oil water contact. And this in particular example I'll show in a minute is in the Permian Basin, and we had an uplift to the west. And this creates, uh, as to King Hubbard's work back in the 1950s, when he worked for Shell, he was documenting these tilted oil water contacts with lateral sweep and actually came up with some analytical formulas for predicting the tilt. And so we were seeing these tilts all, all in, most in, in the St. Andrews formation out here and documented in the unitization agreements that were put together for the main pay fields. And so let's then jump into more detail on type three. This is a St. Andrews of the Permian Basin as it probably looked, uh, the entire section actually looked before the Laramide uplift in New Mexico. And you can see that we had on the, on the left there, the deep Delaware Basin and on the right, the shallower Midland Basin separated by the Central Basin platform. And this is a west-east cross-section. And so what let's do is let's assume that this is what was there in the uh, Mesozoic. And then we go to the tertiary and we start to have these uplifts. It's really two of them that major effects caused by the Basin and Range province where we have a number of uplifts and horse and grobbins formed in uh, central New Mexico. And then that uh, 
was was also uh, part of the tertiary, early tertiary, late Cretaceous uplift called the Laramide Revolution. And what we did is we basically outcropped the St. Andrews formation in the west. That's west of Roswell and Carlsbad, if you're familiar with with New Mexico, and that causes an infiltration of meteorically derived water. And so now the formerly oil and trapped uh, reservoir, in this case the San Andres, if it was continuous laterally enough, it could actually come in from the west, sweep to the east through the San Andres and start to displace some oil to the east. just emphasizing here the horse and grobbins and the outcrops that we had. A fellow in Midland, uh, lives in Midland now, uh, worked in Saudi for a number of years, but uh, Bob Lindsay uh, created this, this uh, cross section and I wanted to give him some credit. The net effect was to sweep what we call a, a massively large oil trap in the St. Andrews. Now, for we like to say for 70 years we were looking for these small closures on top of the ROZ in retrospect. And so Wasson and Seminole are not very small, but they're definitely closures on top of the ROZ. And then the ROZ below those fields, then we like to call a brown field because all you had to do was drill deeper. Uh, with existing wells and start to try to produce that residual oil that was below the oil water contact, the original oil water contact. So this is type three, and what we have called it is a change in the hydrodynamic conditions. It probably was very static at the pre-Cretaceous time frame, and then we swept the lower oil column, uh, changed the oil water contact, and we developed a residual oil zone. If it's below the main pay zone, we call it a brownfield. You can see it there in the center of the graphic. Well, interestingly enough, if you don't have that closure up top of the um, ROZ, you still have the ROZ. And so we said, okay, these are green fields. And so the reason we call them that is because you had to drill new wells to go exploit it if you figured out how to produce oil from the residual oil zone that was uh, below, w was without a major oil uh, trap, a trap in, entrapment above it. So we submitted a grant to RIPSI. Um, some of you are probably not familiar with it. The organization has gone at a 10 year mission but it was located down there in Sugarland and was uh, very, very helpful in, in helping us accelerate the time frame to study this. And the RIPSI report we published in 2016, we mapped these greenfield and brownfield ROZs. And you can see there in the light to the blue is, is the, uh, the, the green fields, and in the darker blue would be the brown fields. Below the main pay, below the main pay zones, like up here in Slaughter, and then in in uh, Wasson, Seminole, Robertson, and and on down the Central Basin platform. The Central Basin platform is a major carbonate shelf, as most of you know, and then this up here we call the north northwest or north shelf. And what we did too is we figured out how that water got to us and it came in from the outcrops out west and we sort of started seeing a trend that caused us to name these as fairways and um, fairways of sweep. And how they get out is another story that for another day, but we, we've got lots of uh, evidence and theories on how that water gets out of the basin. It's a very slow moving process as I'll show you in a minute. So why on earth would Mother Nature uh, water flood an interval for the tertiary time frame and still leave 30 and 45% residual saturation values to explain why we need to understand biogeochemistry? And that's a new topic for most of you. I'm sure it was for me as well. And, and I had the help of a wonderful uh, scientist here that was working to clean up spills and got to know microbes very, very well and, and helped us work our way through this, this rather strange relationship between oil and microbes. 
uh, how do they live and work? Well, it, it's sort of like a Wall Street broker. They get your money, they invest it, they move it around, they take a little bit off the top, and, and so what, uh, what the microbes do is take a little energy off of the transfer of electrons. They're going to move electrons from one particular molecule or atom to another and, and exchange it and change the chemistry. The, the good news in our business for years has been this, this process works and works everywhere underground. These are natural microbes that live far underground. Um, they uh, inhibit themselves, especially when sulfur's involved. Sulfur is one of the most active of the atoms that has this ability to change its state quite ra rapidly, the valence, if you will. And when uninhibited, um, they can change the rocks and oil dramatically, but they're generally inhibited to about 200 parts per million. So let's go back to this profile. This was that Greenfield ROZ with depth, didn't have a main pay on top. And this is uh, from the Gaines County tall cotton area in, in uh, central, uh, central Permian Basin. And so this was that constant nearly 30 to 40 percent oil saturation in the middle zone and uh, on top of that was this transition zone and up to the bottom was this lower transition zone we had a paleo transition zone below and the base of the paleo uh, base of the paleo trap was at the bottom so here's the key reaction we we strongly believe is, is responsible for all of these changes we're seeing. We have calcium sulfate in the form of anhydrite, and we have some uh, hydrocarbon molecule that in this case, we're just using methane. And, and then we have the calcite, the calcium carbonate present in the rocks, and we've got water, of course, and we, we, um, we generate water and H2S. So what the microbes do is they move electrons from the carbon and then they transfer them to the sulfur. H2S is the byproduct created and it can inhibit future activity. Um, well, wait a minute, the type three ROS has a flow field so we can disperse that CO2, that H2S. Well, a lot of processes of changing calcite with magnesium present uh, pretty widely known to be a, a, a dolomization process and sure enough that went on here too so that calcite that we were forming from the the anhydrite now gets modified and we've got new surfaces that are dolomitic surfaces so what we've done now is we've soured the oil and gas and we've created new dolomite surfaces that it, historically and laboratorially derived attraction, favorable attraction to oil over water. So we've modified the oil wettability in this whole process too, because there's oil present and it attracts to the dolomite. So we're showing methane here as a source of carbon, but it may be other hydrocarbon molecules as well. We do think it's biased to the lighter end hydrocarbons present. A mature sweep can keep the inhibiting H2S dispersed. And so now it starts to make us think about how much sweep occurred. So in the type one ROS where that was a basin wide tilt, we probably only had a single pore volume sweep. In other words, the water invades once, it doesn't continue to invade and readjust that oil water contact. The type two uh, breach seal is probably mostly single pore volume sweep, but it can have multiple stages as maybe that seal ruptures more than once and reseals and re ruptures again. And so then a, the type three lateral sweep is the vertical profile variable, but generally multiple pore volumes. And how much pore volume sweep we try to document in one of our REPC projects. So the changes that occur to the reservoir are fascinating. They, we called it a late stage rock diagenesis or a late stage dolomization process. Sometimes I prefer uh, the term pervasive dolomization because it's uninhibited. These processes tend to continue to work over geologic time. And so 
any calcite that's there is dolomitized. A lot of the anhydrite that was there gets converted to calcite and then dolomitized. And we've soured the oil, gas, and water. It does extract some components from the oil. And um, we, we see that effect now too. And then it alters the wettability. So pretty significant stuff. So the first question you got to ask yourself is, well, I didn't get to study this anywhere, so why haven't we noticed this thing before? And I, I would argue that the um, general situation in our uh, nearly static uh, environments, uh, oil and gas basins, is that they're generally static and they don't have a hydrodynamic gradient to carry the, the, uh, the byproduct H2S away. And so we haven't seen this uh, uninhibited microbial process work. The, the process that, that, gets, that limits their work, we call microbial self-limitation, pretty widely known in those circles that involve uh, uh, microbes in, in the uh, community, chemical community. We didn't really recognize these gradients until recently in the main pay zones because their effects on the rock were minimal. And so a lot of this insight comes from David Vance, and uh, he's, uh, he's been immensely helpful on this whole process of trying to understand that. This gets one to thinking about main pay zones, too. So we know that in the process of entrapment, we've got uh, water being displaced by oil. And so in effect, we do have a little bit of this process going on when that uh, exchange, if you will, of oil and water in the pore space occurs. And so maybe that helps explain the mixed wet characteristics that we now widely recognize in many main pay zone intervals. And that um, also works, I might add, in, in, in some, some uh, plastic reservoirs. It's a whole different subject for another day, but um, these mixed wet characteristics baffled our industry for the longest time because if these rocks were laid down in water and oil invaded, how in the heck did we get uh, a, a mixed wet situation, how, how did that oil displace some of that wetted uh, water on the rock? Well, one thing's clear, and that is that biogeochemistry is very important now to understanding our reservoirs. And it all goes all the way from dolomization to gas oil ratios, which we'll hit in a minute, and souring of oil and gas to wettability. So let's talk a little bit more engineering based now and talk about this same zone, this interval of ROZ. And this is a gamma ray on the left. It's porosity logs here. This will be the neutron. This will be the, the, uh, the gamma density or formation density log. And, and there always is a difference between the two due to the assumptions of the tools. Somewhere in the middle lies the true porosity. It's probably usually biased to the neutron side. I'll show you an example of that and a couple of examples of that in a minute. The water saturation is, is shown and oil saturation shown is, is here in the, uh, the middle. And then what typically happens is the pore volume sweep is a function of that porosity that occurs here. And very typically what we find is that, that the, the bow shaped nature is kind of not too evident here, but the bow-shaped nature of that porosity curve and the resistivity curves indicate that we do have variable sweep as a function of depth below the, uh, below the top of the ROZ. And so what we've seen then is that pore volume sweep is minimized in the upper transitional zone. The middle zone uh, can be fairly thoroughly swept. The lower zone can or cannot be thoroughly swept. And so what what we've done with the properties of the oil is look at the decreasing gas oil ratio as a function of pore volume sweep. And indirectly, uh, the, the GOR will be dependent on how much water is swept through there, either due to the solubility of the lighter hydrocarbons or the cyclic hydrocarbons, or just due to this uh, microbial process, which we, we needed a source of carbon for it. And so 
We also would expect that if it's a meteorically derived water somewhere out to the west in our case, then we would see a decreasing water salinity for the more poor volume sweep we have. And we do have some examples of that beneath some oil fields in West Texas. And then we're starting to see the light ends take their effect in decreasing the, uh, increasing the oil viscosity with depth. And sure enough, that, that's, that's an observation we can see even on the mud logs. And so there's this thing called minimum miscibility pressure, which we use in our CO2 flooding world. And sure enough, if you take enough light ends out of the oil, that's gonna increase that MMP, make it a little more difficult to, uh, to make the CO2 and oil interact and, and make, make the oil mobile from the CO2 invasion. And it also has an effect on the formation volume factor, of course, because you've got less gas with them. So this is the green field as we've discussed. And um, uh, we mentioned the brown field versus green field definition, so I won't do that again. So what is below the paleo oil water contact? Well, if it had ex excellent depositional porosity, the zone below would still be laterally swept, but it didn't have the oil. It didn't have necessarily a lot of carbon available, but that dolomitization process can continue too. And that zone can be very thick. In other words, the paleo trap wasn't that whole interval of porosity. It was just the upper part. So we like to call that the pervasively dolomitized interval, sometimes including the ROZ, sometimes leaving it out. But anyway, we call it the PDI. And so let's look at a couple of examples of that. Um, North Central Yoakum County cross section. This is, you've seen this chart before. This is all of the St. Andrews producing wells in the Permian Basin. And obviously it's a broad, broad area. You can see it's a well over 200 miles wide of St. Andrews production throughout the basin. And it's, as I think was mentioned, 1,400 feet thick in most places. And so we've got um, a really good area up here on the north, concentrated. We've got, this would be the Northwest Shelf. And then down here, we've got the Central Basin Platform. So let's look in Yoakum County right here. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this very well, but right in the central northern part of it, we've got a cross section we put together that'll show this PDI. And so here's, here's an example. Now I've emphasized here this difference between about five or 6% um, of the porosity from the formation density and the neutron porosity. Sometimes this gets up into the higher numbers too, 15%, but generally typically we'll see 10 or 12% porosity in this interval. And, and I've highlighted in yellow, and this is just over about a six mile, a little over a six mile cross section. Two things to note. Number one, the porosity is thick and it's laterally continuous. And so this area had a great deal of uh, energetic carbon de carbonate de uh, deposition. And then we call this lower zone the interbedded zone in this particular area. And down here, we've got just an enormous porosity, the yellow house zone, we call it. That was a really widespread uh, porosity interval from just above the Glorietta formation. This cross section is a stratigraphic one. We hung it on the Glorietta data point in these logs. Um, so next, we'll go to Gaines County and really quickly look at this. And, and this is a, the uh, cross section that kind of runs northwest, southeast through the lower half of the county. And we'll, we'll, we'll take a peek at, at uh, the, the continuous nature of the CO2, of the, uh, the porosity interval here. I didn't have time to highlight all the yellow in this, but you can see this good porosity zone here that's continuous all the way down to Andrews County on the south. And this is, this is 15 mile long uh, cross section, huge porosity section in the Sanders. And this is quite typical, I would add, uh, to a lot of the Central Basin platform. And, and, and to a degree, a, a very typical up in the Northwest Shelf and our work in characterizing the, uh, the uh, Ross fairways, we definitely would, would look at the zone. 
and, and track it. So you can see this baby is really, really thick. It's 500 feet thick right there, and now it's actually more like 700 feet thick, and then it's got this interval below. Just imagine how much pore space is available there for something like CO2, anthropogenic CO2. And it's a wonderful opportunity to exploit down the road when we're trying to figure out how to minimize our carbon footprint at the surface. So let's do the summary now. We've got uh, some things that uh, we think we've discovered uh, with a lot of help from our friends. And I think I'm looking at the younger generation. Hopefully a few of you are on this uh, Zoom um, a webinar and, and, and can continue this legacy, I think. Residual oil zones are common. They can be caused not only by us, but by nature itself. And we need to understand their characteristics, their properties, and, and maybe develop some algorithms and models to, to, to do that. A lot of people came out of school uh, into the professional world thinking residual oil was dead oil. Well, no, that's not the case. As we will show in a minute, we can exploit this, especially the upper part of the ROZ with horizontal drilling, and we can exploit it with CO2 EOR and CCUS, utilization and storage. If the pore volume sweep is minor, the ROS oil can be quite live and possess considerable solution gas. ROZs are often below the main pay zones, and so uh, they're also in areas where they have no mobile oil on top of them, or very little mobile oil on top, as evidenced by many, many dry holes we drilled in the St. Andrews around the basin. And this St. Andrews in the basin is, a, is a, probably the, the most wonderful example of the enormous pore space that can accommodate these huge volumes of CO2 in both CCUS and CCS. So continuing this, we, we've, the exciting part of this research was that we've got new laterals that are exploiting this upperly, upper lightly swept ROZ. We, we kind of, in, in a humorous way, we, we, we call this process do rise or depressuring the upper ROZ. What we do is we go in there with a lateral and we take the water out because the, mobile's, the oil's immobile. And the uh, only thing in the pore space that can expand is the gas. And so it starts to move some of that oil, just like we did in gas solution drive we studied in school. And so this process, we, uh, we have seen commercialized 700 new laterals that only need a light stimulation. This is pretty good rock. It's a conventional reservoir. And so we're spread out over about seven counties now doing this and making about 50,000 barrels a day of oil and about 60 million accumulative uh, to date. So I know some states that would love to have that kind of a play going on, a harsh gets in the shadows of the shales in the uh, Delaware and Midland basins, but it's, it's a huge play. There's some excellent evidence that other formations have ROZs and are being exploited in the Permian Basin and other places around the world. Uh, it really, uh, it, it, it's been hidden in the word dewatering. And so the Duras process is a dewatering process to make the oil. And we think that some of the dewatering plays like in Oklahoma were in fact uh, ROZ, a Duras place. Before we stop, though, I want to take a quick environmental sidebar. And, and how do these new ROZ understandings relate to CO2? We can store large quantities of CO2 during the OR, and, and it, it's now, I would say, widely understood around the world, perhaps. And we, we have the test bed at the Permian Basin to demonstrate that with, with almost 80 projects ongoing. It's challenged though, it's, it's got a long uh, investment time and then the oil comes in a delay. And so it's challenged to compete with things like the shale horizontals. And it competes uh, too with uh, 
its own do rise process. It's very much faster return on your investments. But things have changed. And there's tax credits now available. 45Q is, is one that you may have heard a little bit about, I hope. I know that the University of Houston has, has emphasized this. And so it's changing things. We're starting to hear projects that are being planned on capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, their in, in, anthropogenic sources, and moving them into the underground, either via EOR or just disposal into a CCS project. Huge reservoir targets are, are, are available and recognized now, both in the Gulf Coast and here in the Permian Basin. The depressurized ROZs provide enormous pressure sinks and reservoir targets for CO2 injection. And so we've got a lot of opportunity. If we can find the anthropogenic CO2, we can do an environmental side benefit uh, with our EOR process. When we've got one operator already receiving recognitions for storing CO2 during EOR, uh, but it's not, as far as I know, it's not yet in their ROZ they have, but, but it will likely be soon. So let me close here and say, um, our industry is not static. And I'm not kidding anybody when I say that. I know I, I, I see us dynamically moving forward now. The horizontal world has just opened our eyes to many things that we just dreamed about learning before. And so I think you'll, you'll have an exciting future for you if you're young, and, and I wish I were young, uh, to, to take this on too. And, and the key references uh, that I've mentioned in brief and passing are here, so you're, you're welcome to look at those later on. So anyway, I want to thank you for, for everything and, uh, and listening to this webinar. I'm available if you'd like to, to uh, contact me either through the field trip, uh, the uh, websites, and as I've shown here with uh, conference.net. We do a conference each December, by the way, and try to address all things CO2 related and um, generally underground CO2 related, but we do go into surface capture and things like that there as well. It'll be the second week in December this year. And it'll be here in Midland, but we'll do it virtually as well. So reaching out to a bigger, wider audience, international audience as well. So feel free to, to contact us either directly or through this uh, through these websites. Thank you very much. Well, Steve, Christine, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, we've got a number of questions that have, that have come in, uh, but let me, before we go to those questions, let me second uh, the comments that Steve just made about the conference. I've personally had the good fortune to be going out to Midland just about every year for the last 10 years or so. And if you're at all interested in uh, that part of the world or just generally in terms of CO2, EOR, and all aspects of it, um, it's the place to go. And, and frankly, one of the other things that we are delighted to be able to speak to is that the University of Houston is going to begin a, a regular and ongoing participation and support of that conference as well through the work that Christine and, and many of the other folks in our petroleum engineering department are doing. So Steve, uh, it's too bad it won't be in person, but uh, maybe by then things will change. I don't know, but at the very least being associated with that is, is nothing short of fantastic. So certainly wish you the best in that. And we're certainly glad to be a part of it. Hey, a couple of questions that have come in, maybe just as a starter. Uh, one of the questions was about the, if you will, economics 101, supply demand in terms of the amount of CO2 in and around the Houston area and the greater Gulf Coast and the amount of geologic capacity out in the Permian and why the connection uh, could be made, should be made uh, for both of you to speak to, please. Christine, you want to take on the supply? Uh, well, the supply side, we, we've got uh, the numbers I showed. Those are coming from the uh, NPC report. Um, and 
personally, I'm also interested in um, uh, possibilities uh, local to the Gulf Coast area, not just the uh, Permian Basin. Uh, but I think uh, Steve makes a very strong case uh, for uh, taking CO2, significant amounts of it, uh, to the Permian Basin. I'll let you take over. And I know I, I'm looking at Steve and, and maybe maybe frozen for just a moment, but I, I think to your point, Christine, we've got an awful lot of CO2 to be captured in the Gulf Coast region. We have some nearby geologic assets that we'll certainly want to take advantage of. But I think in terms of actually making the balance work, uh, if we're not able to find massive additional CO2 capacity, uh, we, we're not going to be able to achieve anything close to the CO2 capture targets. Then the next question is, if you're going to go all the way to the Permian, that's 450 miles. And if you do some quick math, that's well over a billion dollars to, to build a pipeline. And so you better have some CO2 in that in those volumes to be able to make it worthwhile because that's the name of the game in the pipeline business. So clearly the connectivity is necessary. The volumes certainly support it. And uh, I think without it, we're really not going to be in a position to be able to achieve what we're hoping to achieve in terms of emissions reduction. So a uh, great question from the audience, but I think the compelling story that you guys have made um, Steve, you're back. I'm sorry, you're, you're also muted, but uh, if you can fix that, I tried to address some of the needs of, of uh, what we had in the Gulf Coast area and why the Permian opportunity is so rich. Very good. I, I, I was about to say, I think I know when I got cut off uh, by my connection here, but I was about to say we have these depressured zones that are unbelievably large now too. And you know, we're depressuring the shales, uh, we're depressuring the upper rise, and that's poor. Mm -hmm. Was for CO2 as well. So, we, you know, it's just where do we want to put it and where are the economics really going to be the best is, yeah. I guess, the answer to his question. Well, I know in your conference, and we've talked about this in terms of preparing for it, but we're looking at the uh, we're looking at the geology as not simply a place where oil can be produced and trying to match up ba the balances. And typically, you get about two or three barrels for every ton of CO two. And we've done the math before, and that sort of holds out and everything. But now, looking at the geologic repository as an accretive asset, in terms of being able to really impact emissions and having it be viewed that way. And of course, with the legal issues and policy issues around 45Q, more and more attractive that way. Uh, Steve, I wonder if you could address one of the other questions that's come in, and that is, why does the Permian seem to be so attractive to CO2, EOR? And, and why do the performance aspects of the Permian lend itself so strongly to that? Well, they, it's been a question that we've uh, wrestled with for years and years. Um, a lot of economics of EOR relate to how much oil is left behind in a water flood. And one of the issues there is that wettability factor I tried to spend some time with. And, and if these, if the formation is mixed or fully oil wet, obviously a lot of oil remains after our water floods or after Mother Nature water flood. And so we have 30, 35, 40% oil saturations, even if we water flooded. And so that's a nice enough target. Uh, and, and we can produce sometimes almost as much with CO2 EOR oil with CO2 EOR that we produced with a water flood. And the reason for that is that we sweep almost all of that oil. Once it combines with the CO2, it loosens the surface tension, changes the capillarity forces, and we can produce a great deal of that oil. And so we have a lot of carbonate rock that's mixed wet or oil wet. Uh, there are places elsewhere that have had success, but 
clearly in the Permian, it was a huge success. Well, clearly your answer says it in spades. Uh, all geologies are not the same. That's probably self-evident, but clearly the Permian has been a, a big part of that. Hey, Steve, one other thing that often comes up when we talk about the Raws is there's so darn much water and water disposal. And, and are we going to be in a position to effectively develop the Raws with the existing water management that we currently have? Or are we looking to transform that as well? That's a great question. And, and it has to do with moving water from one formation to another. And we're doing a lot of that in the shales right now. And, and we produce sometimes one barrel for every 10 barrels of water, one barrel of oil for every 10 barrels of water. In many of those shale projects, just like in our ROZ projects, and so we've got to find a home for that oil or that water when, when we're trying to depressure the formation. And so, yes, we're generally going deeper into the Devonian Ellenberger formations and putting the water away there. In the northern central basin and the northwest shelf, we have a very little of that water disposal occurring other than, say, from our Duras process. So we're creating pore space because the removal of the oil that's depressured and, and a lot of opportunity, especially up north. And if we can get that pipeline from the Gulf Coast into the McKamey hub, we've got plenty of pipelines to go north with that CO2 into those areas that are depressured and ready to make oil or ready to put into the water uh, saline formations. So Steve, let me hit you with one more question and then Christine, I've got a philosophical question that's come in for you. So uh, get ready, all right? But Steve, the, the, the question, and it, we hear it a lot at conferences, how much of the CO2 ends up in the formation? People hear about recycle rates and this and that and the other thing, but can you finally put to bed the idea that there's CO2 leakage and that at the hundred percent is the number that people should have in their minds. Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. It has been a, a, a myth of uh, understanding in, in our industry for the longest time. And the reason probably for it is that we always quote in our statistics, the total injection into a project. We don't quote the new injection, we quote both the new and the recycle injection. And of course we capture any of that CO2 that comes back with the oil and water, and then we uh, repressure it, put it back down. And so it's almost a closed loop system. There are very few exceptions to that. Uh, usually if the power goes out, you know, you lose compression on your, on your CO2 and you maybe have to flare it for a little bit. Uh, but that's very, very small. It's de minimis volumes in terms of the total we're, we're talking about. And so what we really need to look is how much of that new CO2 we brought into a field is stored. And it is well over 98, 99%. And so that's what really matters. That's the captured volume that, that is stored in the reservoir. And, and that is one of those uh, one of those things that we have to keep reinforcing, I guess, in the industry is that CCUS does provide a completely closed loop storage system that's permanently in, and safely in, in place. Precisely. So Christine, uh, as we look at CCUS technologies and some of the things that you were presenting, question comes in, is it ever going to be economically feasible not to use fossil fuels. Can we envision a world with no fossil fuels? And, and I think that sort of speaks to timing more than anything, doesn't it? I think it might also to whether we would tolerate nuclear. Because mm. nuclear really is a, a major other approach uh, that's uh, potentially big enough uh, to consider that sort of question. Uh, but 
if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just make a plug for the research effort that we're working on uh, at University of Houston involving four universities. We don't know if we'll get the funding, but we are uh, proposing uh, to look at emissions neutrality and thinking about not just the point sources that are stationary, but all the emissions uh, and 85% of the emissions from crude oil are uh, from uh, combustion and in mostly internal combustion engines that are uh, most of them moving trucks, cars, buses, etc. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, when you look at these sorts of major efforts, uh, you start really trying to follow the carbon. Uh, and uh, what we uh, notice is the likelihood that natural gas needs to stay um, for the long term. Uh, we might be able to migrate away from crude oil, but that means a huge change in transportation infrastructure. Uh, so these are wonderful questions to think about. Um, Going back to the nuclear comment, uh, if you go nuclear, it means you are thinking that transportation goes electric and or hydrogen. Um, but it, let me add this, uh, Christine, that if, if we go hydrogen, the more likely economic source for hydrogen is from hydrocarbons. Absolutely, from natural so gas. CO2 great. is great. a byproduct of that process. Yes, it is. Uh, blue hydrogen from uh, natural gas. Uh, so natural gas, again, thank you for mentioning that because that's what's in the back of my mind when I make that statement, that natural gas has an uh, enormous future um, with this kind of philosophical question. <laughs> well, you know, along with that philosophy, I think one of the things that our center holds close in terms of a foundational belief is that focusing on the fuel is the wrong question. Focusing on the emissions is what we need to be focused on. And so fuels can change that, technologies can change that, cost-effective means of making those transformations. It ain't about the fuel, it's about the emissions. And, uh, and I think that's why this CCUS technology for us has a, a very front and center period of time here in this transition. It's probably not going to be forever in terms of centuries, but certainly clearly now very, very important for sure. Um, Steve, you know, another question out, out in the, the area, and, it, and it, it begs the question. I mean, we're all reading the paper about negative $38 a barrel oil out in the Permian, and everybody was just about ready to pack it up and leave. And and that's not really true. Speak a little bit about just the general atmosphere out there these days and how you see the future going forward in terms of the Permian, these kinds of technologies, and that's generally the industry out there. Well, uh, the short-lived spike, as you mentioned, was exactly that. It was a, 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 basically a figment of the market system that we devised that allowed for paper barrels to be traded. And so what we saw was the supply and demand was, was radically changed with what, which what I call the flotilla effect right before COVID hit. And, and that had to do with Saudi saying, well, you're taking our market away with all the shale production. So we're going to, we're going to try to, crash the oil price and get this back into some sort of sense of reality. And so that's what happened. And then you couple that whammy with the double whammy of COVID and demand destruction around the world. And our price just went in the tank. Now it's climbed back to the forties and there's a lot of feeling in Midland and, and, and most oil centers, I would say that we've found the new norm somewhere in the forties. And for the next five to years or so, that's probably where it's going to be uh, in, on average. And so let's just forget about what it did in March and, and just consider that to be a widespread anomaly that hit the whole world. So. Well, you know, along that same theme, Christine, 
you're dealing with students every day at the university. And they're looking at petroleum engineering and thinking about the same questions I just posed to Steve here. What are your students saying in terms of how you see the future going forward? And what, what do you tell them when they ask you those kinds of questions? Let me first say that I adore University of Houston students. They are unspoiled and uh, they they are very aware of what is going on. Um, so uh, we are still emphasizing the petroleum engineering fundamentals, uh, but I personally am keenly interested as are some of my colleagues in uh, introducing more about these subjects uh, we speak about today. Um, now, the CCUS, the CO2 Enhanced Oil Recovery, uh, definitely is uh, encountered in coursework um, in petroleum engineering at University of Houston. Uh, but where we're not uh, yet um, putting much material uh, has to do with the injection side, it has to do with uh, even um, this uh, compensation for uh, CO2 emissions through CCGS. Uh, uh, and the thing is, um, as you mentioned, it's about the emissions. And if we handle those emissions, uh, geologic storage can handle a lot of those emissions. Um, and if we are able to do this cost effectively, uh, through incentives of some sort, um, petroleum engineers could be as busy on injection as they are on production in the future. We have every reason to take an interest in this. Well, you know, and a lot of the a lot of the skills and capabilities and data analytics and computational analysis and all of that is. Uh, is fundamental to the petroleum industry. And uh, you know, you don't have to go to work for Microsoft or Google to be on the cutting edge of technology, do you? I mean, it's a, it's a real opportunity that we're, we're pretty excited about. You know, we're nearing our, our, our closing uh, moments here. Steve, I don't know if you've got any overarching thoughts you'd, you'd wanna leave the audience with today uh, that we haven't spoken about. Well, a couple of things that have occurred to me since uh, finishing up here is, is that uh, my IT guy that handles the stuff at the CO2 conference wanted me to mention our LinkedIn page. There's more information there, uh, as well as, as those conference.net and uh, residualozones.com websites. And then lastly, I, I, I want to emphasize the, the need to study. In fact, one of the questions I happened to see on the chat room was, how do you get involved? And, and so uh, the universities are the best way to get involved in, in, in this kind of research. And the master's programs uh, pick a topic, uh, something like uh, how much sweep, for example, uh, what does sweep do uh, to the oils? What does sweep do to the rocks? Uh, some of these are long-term processes, but you know, there's all kinds of things that we don't yet understand fully that I would love to be tackled in the university environment to, to better better predict what these rocks and oils look like. And so, uh, you know, we're just opening the door. Uh, fractures, for example, natural fractures. I, I think we need to learn more about those. Some of those are actually connected to the crust as we're learning. Uh, so where not to inject water and CO2 is, is a question that we need to address, both in the Gulf Coast and the Permian Basin. We have some fractures that are connected to the crust in both places. So. Uh, we need to learn more about that. So, Same old story, isn't it, Steve? The more you learn, the more you know you don't know, right? <laughs> oh, is that right, ever? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you bet. Christine, any, any parting shots you'd like to share with everyone? Uh, just going back to the comment about our proposal, um, if there are industry potential industry partners out there, uh, we'll be looking for that aspect uh, in the next month. Uh, 
Um, otherwise, uh, Chuck, I just really appreciate being invited to participate with Steve Melzer. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great opportunity. And working with you is always good, too. So thank you. Well, I appreciate those comments. Uh, for me, this is, uh, this is really easy because being surrounded by smart people is the easiest way to, to run these rep webinars. And so thank you both. Um, for all of you that have attended today, uh, certainly appreciate it. I want you to also encourage all of you to go to our website, uh, see the upcoming events that are, uh, that are a part of our going forward activity. Um, as the, the act, the continuation of this webinar series, we will be moving into October uh, with every Friday during the month of October with many of the topics that we were discussing just briefly even today. Not only CCUS, which will be our first topic on, on October the 9th on, on that Friday, but every Friday after that, you can see the hydrogen economy. And we talked a little bit about gray, blue, and green and the transition of the hydrogen economy in a place in the world here in the Houston area where there's more hydrogen pipeline and production than anywhere else in the world by a order of magnitude. Of course, our electric grid and how decarbonization can be achieved through renewables, through CCUS, through all of the integration that's uh, so important. And again, Texas being one of the major renewable centers in the entire world in terms of uh, the capacity that we have in place. And so we have a wonderful opportunity there and we'll speak in great detail. And then finally, the circular economy around plastics. I think it's a, a well-known fact for all of you that, uh, that the growth of crude oil and the continuation of crude oil is largely driven by the demand for plastics in the hydrocarbon industry. Transportation and, and electrification of the transportation industry will certainly impact the demand for crude, but we'll continue to need plastics and and we'll also continue to be concerned about the circular economy, recycle, reuse, and, and reconfiguration of those kinds of molecules. So please keep an eye out for these four webinars. What I can do also here is plug the students that we have utilized throughout this summer uh, with internships and connections that, uh, that have been made here uh, at the campus, but also in the community in terms of the research work that's gone on here. So we'll be presenting some of those findings, uh, be able to have all of you be able to tune in to those web webinars and, and be able to, to discuss them in, in great detail. So look forward to that. And also again, wanna thank Hunt and Andrews and Kurt, uh, their, their continued support of our webinar series. We couldn't do it without them. And we're certainly glad to have them be a part of our Center for Carbon Management and Energy. So with that, I guess we'll all be grateful and thankful for those of us in the Houston area and places that have not been hit by the hurricane. And our thoughts and prayers certainly go out to those in the Golden Triangle over in Louisiana. We'll keep our fingers crossed for everyone there. So thank you all for attending. Have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.